service record. To review his biodata sheet would leave little time for his comments. But I must point to one accomplishment that must give him a great deal of pride. For in 1970, the government of the student body of Iowa State presented a President's Award to him for outstanding contribution to educational, social, and cultural well-beings of the students of this university. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you a university president who cares, Dr. Robert Parks. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, with such distinguished people on this platform, the visiting congressman, Congressman Wilbur Mills, and our own distinguished home folks, the governor, Governor Ray, Senator Miller, Congressman Smith, it may be appropriate that I be seen and heard, but not for long. I'm sure they have more to say, and you're more anxious to listen to them. I do want to welcome all of you people to this new structure, this fine structure that we're very pleased to have. And I want to point out, because in these days of scarce resources, things like this really ought to be understood, that this building was constructed without state or federally appropriated money through fees of the student body, uh, the students here at Iowa State, and through private donations. We are pleased to have this facility. We are very pleased to have you share it and to be the first group to use this fine James H. Hilton Coliseum. Iowa State University, as all of you know, I'm sure, is a part of what is known as the land-grant college movement. As a land-grant college, Iowa State was created for the purpose of the edu for educating the sons and daughters of farmers and mechanics. And I think it is highly appropriate that this group, representing as it does a great cooperative movement in this country, should have its meeting on this campus, because the cooperative movement itself has meant so very much to farmers and their families and working men and their families throughout the country. Without extending my remarks further, I want simply to say to you again that we're so pleased to have you. Our university, I think, has been of service to many of you in the past. I hope it can be of more service to you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Parks. Agriculture is important to all Iowans. The well-being of urban Iowans is directly related to the level of prosperity of Iowa's farms. Broad economic and social adjustments in business, government, church, and school life follow farm economic changes. Iowa's governor recognizes this and has been a friend of agriculture over the years. He has shown his interest in and his support of Iowa cooperatives by officially proclaiming October as Cooperative Month during each of the three years that he has been in office. It is my privilege to present to you a governor who cares, the governor of the state of Iowa, Robert Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerald. Senator Miller, Congressman Mills, Congressman Smith, President Parks, Dr. Hilton, and all of you distinguished people here at, on the platform, officers, directors and members of cooperatives and guests, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm indeed impressed, Gerald, with this meeting and with the way in which you have things so well organized. As I was sitting there, I couldn't help but think about 
not long ago when I was scheduled to give some remarks, as I am this afternoon, with a main speaker to follow. And the MC stood up and was a little bit nervous, and he started introducing the main speaker. Finally, someone who was sitting next to him leaned over and he tugged at his coat. And finally, he got his attention and he leaned over and listened. And I think it was rather obvious the person was saying that you overlooked the governor who was to give some remarks. So with kind of an embarrassment, the MC stopped everything and he said in recovery, well, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, he said they told me that probably there would be at least one goof at this program, and so now I want to introduce the governor of the state of Iowa. <laughs> Gerald, the only thing I would suggest is that you not spend too much time here at Iowa State during this rally. If you spend very much time, you might end up with a doctor's degree, and I think it'd be very difficult to call you Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I want to welcome Congressman Mills here to the state of Iowa and to Iowa State University. When we talk about Mills and the state of Iowa, Congressman, we're usually talking about property taxes. And when in Washington they talk about Mills, they're usually talking about revenue sharing. Well, I don't really think this is the time or the place to talk about revenue sharing as such. As important as it is to us in the state of Iowa and to all of our states, I do think that this is the time and this is the place to talk about another type of sharing, cooperative sharing. Sharing in buying, in selling, in savings, and in responsibility. This is the place this tremendous new Coliseum is an appropriate place for this meeting which marks the beginning, the opening of this beautiful new building. I'm sure that everyone here recognizes that Iowa is a cooperative state. We rank third nationally in the amount of business farmers have with their marketing, supply, and service co-ops. We rank second nationally in the number of co-ops. This is impressive, just as this gathering today is impressive. And much of the credit for Iowa's national standing and cooperation belongs right here in Ames to Iowa State University, which has provided research and leadership for the co-op movement. We owe a special debt of thanks to the man who did so much to make this university what it is, the former president of Iowa State University, after whom this hall is named, Dr. James Hilton. Iowa cooperatives, Dr. Hilton and Dr. Parks, will continue to rely on the resources of this great educational facility. This, therefore, is the logical place for the observance of Cooperative Month to begin. This is also the time. October is a time that we recognize, a time that I have proclaimed as Cooperative Month. It is a time for co-ops to recognize a commitment, a commitment to a better tomorrow. It is a time to reflect on the contributions of cooperatives. It is a time for co-op managers and directors to develop plans to improve the economic and social well-being of their members. And it is a time for cooperative members themselves to make known just what they expect of their cooperatives and to affirm their support for their cooperatives. You know, a cooperative serves as a competitor in the marketplace, as a yardstick to assure members that the goods and the services that they buy are available at competitive prices, whether purchased from the co-ops or some other corporate entity. Through a co-op, a member of ordinary means plays a role in business ownership. And to the extent he is successful in the venture, he can share in the savings of that business while having something to say 
about the kind and the quality of service he wants. That is putting economic power directly in the hands of the people. Now, Henry Shriver, a farmer philosopher, in talking about cooperative members and what they should keep in mind, said this, and I'd like to quote. He said, remember this simple rule. A co-op is not a weapon. A co-op is a tool. And he added that when we think of co-ops, we think of agriculture. But farmers have no exclusive on co-ops. More than 60% of the nation's independent food stores purchase through co-ops. And much of the news that you read and that you see each day comes over wires of a great big co-op, the Associated Press. And just about every check that you write comes through a clearinghouse owned and operated on a cooperative basis by members, member banks. And then there is an intangible aspect of cooperatives. It is known as a cooperative spirit. That is a spirit of working together, of building together. It is that which goes beyond the marketing of grain or milk or providing electricity or processing soybeans. And I think it's interesting to note that young people understand this also. And let me illustrate that with a quote that comes from the president of the student body here at Iowa State University. Steve Zembaugh, speaking at a convention in Ohio a year ago, said that, and I quote, I see a spirit of cooperation lacking in many of our soapbox crusaders. How senseless it seems in our civilized society that one should even mention revolution as a means of coping with problems. If we, as Americans, are truly civilized, it would seem we must resort to more peaceful means during the 70s to cope with our problems. What will be the means in the 70s? What will be the avenues open? All the answers might well come in a very simple commodity, a commodity called the spirit of cooperation, a spirit for the 70s. That's the end of the quote. Steve Zumba said it very well. And I think you will agree that he grasped the intangible, the force that has made cooperatives so great and so successful. Simply stated, it is people working together to make things happen. I compliment you, and I wish you the very best during this rally. And Ger Gerald, I want to deliver to you this proclamation proclaiming October as Cooperative Month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Ray. I tried to think of something appropriate to come back to the Dr. Pepper business, but all I could think of was Gay Ray, and that wouldn't have fit, so I'm not going to do it. He's gone. I feel particularly humble in the comments that I'm about to make. For without the effort and dedication of Dr. James Hilton, there would be no Iowa State Center no C.Y. Stevens Auditorium, no little theater, no continuing education building, and no James Hilton Coliseum. Far more than that, a tremendous void would have existed in the educational advancement of Iowa State University and the growth of Iowa had not a North Carolina farm boy found his way to Ames, Iowa. Dr. Hilton, would you come forward, please? As an expression of our appreciation 
and representing all of the farmers in Iowa who do business through cooperatives. It is my privilege to award to you, sir, this plaque, which says, the Iowa Institute of Cooperation presents this Double C Cooperatives Care Award to Dr. James Hilton in recognition of exceptional contributions to agriculture on the occasion of this first official meeting in the James H. Hilton Coliseum, October 2, 1971. Ladies and gentlemen, a truly great American who has always cared, Dr. James Hilton, President Emeritus. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I accept this plaque on behalf of all of those in Iowa and beyond our boundaries who helped build the Iowa State Center. The students, the staff, the alumni, industry, individuals, and I dare say that practically every organization represented here today made a contribution toward the center. I am glad we have it, and I hope all of you will feel free not only to come into the Coliseum, but to come into the other buildings and use them as much as is possible. That is what the Iowa State Center is for. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Senator Jack Miller has been a member of the United States Senate since 1961. He is currently the ranking Republican on the Senate Agriculture Committee, and that's important. He is a member of the Senate Committee on Finance, Committee on Problems of the Aging, and Joint Senate House Economic Committee. Senator Jack has appeared on cooperative programs on numerous occasions. His background as a tax attorney has given him a keen awareness of the tax treatment of cooperative businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, a senator who cares, Senator Jack Miller. Thank you, Gerald, President Scow, Monsignor Weber, Dr. Parks and Dr. Hilton, my colleagues, Congressman Mills and Congressman Smith, fellow Iowans and visitors from our neighboring states. Needless to say, I am most pleased to be here to join all of you in this program kicking off Cooperative Month in which we salute our nation's cooperatives and particularly our Iowa cooperatives. Rural Electric, Telephone, Farm Supply, Grain, Marketing, Credit, and others. It is also a pleasure to see my good friend Wilbur Mills of Arkansas. Here is your keynote speaker. He is a great congressman and a great American. And it's very understandable why a number of influential people think Wilbur ought to be President of the United States. He hasn't said yet what he thinks, but let me give you a clue. I don't know how many of you have ever been down in Arkansas during football season, but if you have, you know the people down there are the most football-minded people in the country. When the University of Arkansas is playing a football game, everything else stops. 
Either the folks go to the game or they listen to it on their radio and TV sets. No funerals, no weddings, and if a game warden catches somebody out hunting while the game is on, he gets hauled in, license or no license. Mothers don't want their little boys to grow up and be president. That's second place. They want them to grow up and be the head football coach at the University of Arkansas. Now, last Saturday, a terrible thing happened. Tulsa University beat the University of Arkansas, and already there's talk of a new head football coach, and that might give you a clue to what Wilbur Mills is really thinking about. <laughs> Here in Iowa, the cooperative movement can be traced back almost 100 years ago. But it wasn't until 1915 when the state legislature passed an act to provide for the incorporation of cooperative associations that the foundation stone for cooperatives as we know them was laid here in Iowa. This Magna Carta for Iowa cooperatives was overhauled and brought up to date by the legislature in 1935. And in 1970, a most significant law was enacted, establishing efficient and modern procedures under which cooperatives can merge or consolidate to meet changing and growing needs of their members. About a year and a half ago, I was called upon to make a speech in Colorado in which I was supposed to look into my crystal ball and forecast agricultural developments in the 70s. One development I predicted relates to bargaining power for farmers, a concept is which, which is quite popular, but it's not easily reduced to specifics. Here's what I said out in Colorado. There have been proposals, including one of my own, to extend the marketing order laws, now covering milk, to other commodities by referendum of the producers in regions or throughout the country. On the other hand, bargaining power for farmers already exists in the form of cooperatives. Here is one point on which all farm organizations can reach agreement, and I believe we will see increased mergers and affiliations of farm cooperatives designed to provide greater strength in the marketplace. And along with this will probably come changes in the antitrust laws which will go beyond present exemptions to permit these more powerful combinations. Now, I didn't know about it at the time, but the very day I gave that speech, Felco and Land O'Lakes announced that they were going to merge. And a few weeks later, the Iowa legislature passed the new law facilitating mergers and consolidations of cooperatives. Now, there's a reason for this, and all of you know it. Cooperation in the form of partnerships is fine in limited cases, but it is just too unwieldy when there are hundreds and even thousands of members. The only answer is to permit them to use the corporate form. And that's what the Iowa legislature did clear back in 1915. For years, our federal income tax laws have looked upon cooperatives as partnerships for income tax purposes because they have been democratically controlled by their members and their patrons. They've been well managed, and every farm and rural community has benefited from them. Our state and our nation are stronger because of them. And I join with you in a salute to them. And I particularly wish to thank the Iowa Institute of Cooperation for arranging this most appropriate and outstanding program. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Miller. <clears throat> we have with us this afternoon a farm boy from down Altoona way. Some way or another, he finds time to run that farm and at the same time, run a chunk of the government. He's a member of the House Committee on Appropriations and the Committee on Small Business. I'm really a little bit confused because I heard someone ask him which seat he wanted on the platform and he said he didn't care. And I wanted to introduce him as a congressman who cares. And he does care. And here for some comments and to make a very important introduction, the fifth congressional district representative to the House of Representatives, Congressman Neil Smith. Mr. Pepper, Senator Miller, Congressman Mills, uh, Dr. Parks, Dr. Hilton, uh, Mount Senior Weber, other distinguished guests on the platform, and my friends. I'm rather taken back by that uh, flattering introduction. What he was trying to say in so many words is I care about somebody's seat besides my own. Anyway, I do want to say that it is a pleasure to be here today and to help christen this great new auditorium, named after Dr. Hilton. And of course, it is also a pleasure to be here and to be asked to say a few words to this great group and to introduce our main speaker. He is a most important person for this most important group the producers of the food and fiber for the world. You are producers who have organized yourselves into co-ops. You have recognized that while government can help, government cannot do everything. You have to help yourself. I am reminded somewhat of that uh, speech I heard a while back where this leader said, and I want to tell you two things. He said, I want you to know that things are better than they have ever been. And also, the Congress is responsible for this mess we're in. <laughs> well, I want to say that Congress is not capable of getting us into all this mess. And if Congress can't get us into all this, it can't get us out of all of it either. You're going to have to help yourselves part of the time. Now, people must do some things to help themselves. And one of the tools that farmers use is co-ops. Farmers have always used co-ops. Way back in the pioneer time, when the first pioneers came up the Mississippi and then up the Skunk River to Squaw Creek, and we're on the bank of Squaw Creek. Two or three of them probably landed right here and farmed. They cooperated. One of them would help the other when he was sick. They'd help one another get up a wood pile in the winter. They had a co-op, but it was a two or three family co-op. But you know, by the time of the bad 30s, we had discovered the hard way that two and three family co-ops were not big enough. The market had changed. The whole marketing system had changed. We even had to have co-ops so we could buy such necessities as electricity in this country. Well, times were bad, all right, in those days. But you know, it's an ill will, it's an ill wind that blows no good. And one good thing that came out of the Depression, I suppose, was the fact that it certainly speeded up 
the day when farmers and producers would organize into co-ops. And so the man I am about to introduce has been a very important person during the past 30 years when these co-ops were being developed. for poor folks, but for good, hard-working folks in this country. For example, I remember when the investment credit was about to go off. He made sure that for two more years, it stayed on in such a way that it would help producers like you in this audience. And when various bills have been passed over the years, he has made sure that they have given fair treatment to the producers of this country places like Iowa and Arkansas. Yes, he enjoys and he deserves the tremendous respect that he has in the Congress for his ability, for his honesty, for his tenacity. Yes, and for his generous use of just plain good common sense. Yes, my friends, the man I'm about to introduce is really a truly effective leader in the Congress of the United States, and he is your friend, and I expect him to show that with a round of applause as I introduce Congressman Wilbur Mills. Thank you. Neil Smith, my good friend, and the 5th District Congressman, my good friend, Senator Jack Miller, Reverend Clergy, Gerald Pepper, who I think has done an excellent job, do you not, as Master of Ceremonies? <laughs> Dr. Hilton, Dr. Parks, Ladies and gentlemen of Iowa, I'm extremely happy, and I'm just about half stating it, to get to be with you today to participate in recognition of Iowa Cooperative Month. I'm particularly pleased and honored to get to be introduced by my good friend Neil Smith and to get to sit by another good friend Jack Miller. Now, you uh, may wonder why I can be so friendly with uh, Democrats and Republicans alike. In Arkansas, I grew up where there were two wings of the Mills Party. One was Republican and the other was Democrat. So it's very easy for me to have good Republican friends and good Democratic friends. Now, it's also a real privilege to visit this world-renowned oldest of all land-grant colleges, Iowa State University, which has uh, contributed so much for so long a period to what I like to call the miracle of American agriculture. I think it's very fitting. It's an honor for me to join you to recognize the great and lasting contribution that the many cooperative efforts in agriculture have made and are still making to the well-being of, of our farm community and to the standard of living of all of our citizens, not just farmers, but all American citizens. First, I must tell you that I've known Neil Smith for a number of years. In fact, it makes me think I've known him so long makes me think of a story. When Neil, uh, Moses, and I got to the Red Sea, you don't believe it? Neil Smith, who was then serving as a public relations man, as before he became a farmer and a congressman, 
But Moses, how are we going to get across? Moses turned to Neil and he says, I'm going to raise my hands toward heaven. And when I do, the waters will part. We'll cross on dry land. Neil said, Moses, if you do that, I'll get you at least two verses in the Old Testament. Neil has always lived up to his word. Now, all of Iowa, not just the 5th District, is very fortunate to have him in the Congress. You're very fortunate as well to have this very fine friend of mine in the United States Senate. Although Neil is kept busy as a highly respected and effective member of the Committee on Appropriations, which I'd have to say Neil is about the second busiest committee in the Congress, not the first. Uh, would you pardon me, Neil? Second busiest. Of course, Ways and Means Committee outstrips them all. <laughs> he has, over the years, successfully championed the cause of the little man in many legislative areas. This respect, his services, his contributions as a member of the committee on small business, and if you don't think a farmer is a small businessman, you don't know agriculture because there can't anybody but a businessman anymore survive on a farm. He's got to be a magician almost. I'm coming to that later. But anyway, his efforts in this direction are all well recognized by all of his congressional colleagues. While he's not a member of the Committee on Agriculture, Neil Smith has been a sound, persuasive, aggressive, a very effective voice for all our Iowa farmers and all of the farmers of the nation. I know we were all pleased that his leadership over the years in sponsoring legislation to establish strategic reserves for feed grains, wheat, and soybeans is at long last yielding results. Now, I'm informed that on next Monday, October 4, the full Committee on Agriculture will consider his bill, H.R. 1163, the Strategic Storable Agricultural Commodities Act of 1971. This long-needed legislation provides that the Secretary of Agriculture shall establish and maintain a separate reserve of inventories of wheat, feed grains, and soybeans. This reserve would be operated in a manner that would protect the consumer, promote and protect our export markets, help stabilize livestock prices, and most importantly at all, of all, I think, I'm sure Neil has this in mind, increase farm income. I'm sure all of you join me. Well, from my notes, you came in too soon. I was about to say, I'm sure all of you join me or join me in a great salute to this true friend of farmers, uh, Neil Smith. You've already done that. I didn't want to leave anything out. Now, I appreciated also the very gracious introduction that the governor gave. I appreciated so much this opportunity to get to meet both Dr. Hilton, President Emeritus, and Dr. Parks of the uh, Iowa State University. As I said, this university has contributed so much over the years, and I've heard about it all of my life. Never dreamed that I'd ever get to be here in this great Dr. James Hilton Coliseum on the first occasion of any meeting, I believe, Dr. Hilton, and to get to be with you. And then, too, I'm very pleased, since you have retired, that uh, you stayed in Iowa long enough that you don't have to go back to North Carolina. I'm also pleased that it's been possible to find such a worthy successor to the great works that you've done for so many years. Your university is known not just in Iowa, but it's known throughout the United States and throughout the world. Now I'd like to discuss with you today 
My views of the state of the economy and its implications for agriculture. Over the past month, we've been treated to a vast array of news accounts concerning the state of our economy, domestic and international, the President's new economic policy and its chances for success. Domestically, we have been experiencing and are continued to experience inflation as debilitating as it is pervasive. In addition, the general level of economic activity has failed to respond appropriately to the power of positive thinking as the number of our unemployed has increased and the unemployment rate has edged upward from 3.5% in December of 1969 to 6.1% in August of 1971. Internationally, we were rapidly moving toward the end of the road. As continued deficits in our balance of payments pump more unwanted dollars abroad, our international monetary system creaked and groaned as both we and our major trading partners avoided the obvious and necessary changes in exchange rates and the needed adjustments in our international monetary and fiscal arrangements. Moreover, our once favorable balance of trade had declined and then suddenly disappeared as the demand for and the market access availability to imports into the United States outstripped the foreign demand for and market access granted to United States exports. In short, the economic situation both domestically and internationally, had become quite bleak. But let us say, lay aside for the moment discussion of the past. Let us look to the future. The President did finally propose a program which has now been modified and refined by the Committee on Ways and Means in unprecedented speedy action. The tax aspects of the President's program will be before the House of Representatives on Tuesday next, less than 30 days from the date the committee began to consider the President's request. As to that future in the overall, domestically we must have an effective follow-through on an incomes policy, including control of government expenditures that will restore confidence in our economy and remove unwarranted anticipation of further price increases. This can only be done by assuring producers and consumers, and indeed all sectors of the economy, that none will be forced to sustain economic sacrifices while others benefit. Internationally, we must achieve a realistic realignment of currencies and a res restoration of equity in our economic relationships. However, this must be done in a manner that will assure continued expansion of trade throughout the world on a mutually satisfactory basis with specific recognition of changes in real economic strength abroad and new economic responsibilities. But what about agriculture? It's time we recognize that while the Agricultural Act of 1949, as amended, may have served to, de uh, to prevent further depression in our agricultural economy, it certainly has not resulted in prosperity for the farmer, at least not for those of you who are left in agriculture. I believe that the case has, can be made I believe it has been made that the inflationary trends, the low level of economic activity have burdened the people who make their livelihood through farming more than any other group of our working citizens. Per capita income for the entire economy rose only 2.5% between 1969 and 1970. Farm income declined during that period. Average personal real income gains were smallest 
in the agricultural states in the great, of the Great Lakes. Gains were well below national levels in the west-north-central states of the Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri, and if Arkansas were a part of that group, it could be included too. Interestingly enough, the Department of Commerce explained these income trends in the following terms, quote, regionally, the smallest personal income gains tended to be in those areas where income from commodity production was weakest and where commodity producing industries are most important, unquote. In plain language, ladies and gentlemen, this means that farmers in farming areas are suffering most in a sick economy. You here today know better than I uh, that uh, what is the state of our agricultural economy. But just in order that you may know I know just a little bit about it, let me give you a few statistics anyway. In the past two years alone, the index of prices paid by farmers, including interest, taxes, and wages, has increased about 10 percent. In contrast, the index of prices received by farmers has increased only 2 or 3 percent. This year, farmers' interest charges, taxes, and wages paid hired labor are fully 15 percent higher than two years ago. An eight-foot tandem disc, which cost $522 uh, in 1969, cost $570 in early 1971. A grain drill, which cost $2,000 in 1969, cost more than $2,250 in early 1917. A combine, which cost $15,400, in 1969 cost more than $17,000 early this year. Farmers must pay for this machinery, this interest, these taxes, and any hired labor by selling farm products at prices only 2 or 3 percent higher than two years ago. I wish I could tell you that I feel the prospects for the year ahead, 72, will not be as bleak price-wise. Even if the new measures taken and proposed by the President help to turn around the overall economy, the chances for much improvement in the major agricultural commodity sectors are dim. The official crop outlook alone bodes further an aggravated farm depression. When one considers the high standard of living that is available in the United States, that is on the average, the state of our farm income and farm economy is almost beyond my comprehension. Today, as our farm population has dwindled to less than 5% of our total population, Technical advises by, uh, advances by farmers in this country have enabled us to produce a surplus far beyond our domestic needs. Instead of being rewarded for this productivity, however, the farmer has been penalized. In the past decade, the consumer expenditures for all foods have declined about 4% as a percent of personal disposable income. But it's tragic that the farm value of consumer expenditures for food, that is the value to the farmer, has declined from 6.2% to 4.8% of personal disposable income. As a result, the farmer today faces continuing and heavy agricultural surpluses with no real plan or adequate system for controlling those surpluses. In addition, our farmers face increased competition from foreign agricultural producers. For example, 
Official forecast <coughs> indicate a farm crop of $5.3 billion for the United States as a whole. 5.3 bushel, uh, billion bushels. With a billion bushels of that raised here in the state of Iowa alone. Now this is an all-time record, I'm told, some 30% above 1970. Grain sorghum production will rise 30%, another record. Output of the four, uh, four feed grains will rise a record 26% above last year. Wheat output will be 16% higher. Our field crops will be about 10% uh, in heavier supply. Income from livestock products has held up best in these bitter months just past. But what do you think that a 30% increase in feed supplies will do uh, to feed grain prices? What do you think it will do to the prices of meat, and eggs, and poultry, and milk? What do you think it will do to farm income? What do you think further farm depression will do to the national economy? No farmer acting alone can affect total supplies of any major commodity, nor can any farmer alone affect the price at which he must sell. How many ways has this basic condition facing the farmer been stated over the many years? More importantly, how much longer are we going to ignore it in striving for an agricultural policy really aimed at improving the competitive status of the American farmer in the markets in which he sells and buys. These basic market conditions were, of course, the reasons for the farm programs instituted by the Congress to stabilize farm output and income over the past 40 years. We too often fail to recognize that these farm programs have never been written for the farmer alone. The stabilization programs, the market order programs, and the support of farm cooperatives have been written explicitly in the national interest, in the interest of all Americans. Yet, in major part, the stabilization programs for field crops are not working well. Independent analysts at the land-grant universities report that the supply adjustment features of the administration set-aside program are much less effective than those in the commodity programs operating under the 1965 Act. Voluntary supply management alone does not seem to meet the needs of the times. There are market orders that are helping to give some of our farmers some of the merchandising instruments that other industries in our country have long enjoyed. Yet I believe it is not clear that those in government who administer these programs understand that the order program cannot operate if the small and localized markets of 40 years ago are to be the only markets they know anything about. They do not exist anymore, those markets. Farm marketing must, therefore, be oriented to the regional, national, and world markets that do exist today, the only markets that we have. Some in government at times seem only grudgingly to execute the often declared intent of the Congress to provide stable output, prices, and incomes for basic crops. While there is pro forma support of the market order program, there is too often failure to adjust orders to the real dimensions of the markets. For example, there's been only one reluctant acquiescence by the administration in such efforts by farmers as the dairy-based plans to adjust total output to market demands. There is pro-farmer support for regional cooperatives, but there is an uneasy feeling among many farmers that I meet and talk to that parts of the administration do not really approve 
I'm talking about the Agriculture Department primarily, do not really approve or support these self-help efforts. And yet the real questions of farm policy involve the things that can be done, must be done in the national interest to invest farm producers with the same capacity to earn an equitable income that prevails in other industries in the United States. The first question is what they themselves can do that they are not now doing. The second question is what government can and must do to facilitate achievement of equal economic power by the producers of our food and fiber. Some specialty farmers working together have been able to develop domestic and foreign markets to differentiate their products by brand and package, to distribute benefits and burdens equitably, to build demand by promotion and advertising, and to avail themselves of the marketing techniques that non-farm businesses use. Yet these specialty farmers could not succeed except for marketing orders tailored to their own needs. Unfortunately, for many reasons known to all of us, the capacity to sow merchandise is foreclosed to producers of most of our basic crops, if not all. If in the national interest, we are to build a marketing framework in which farmers can earn equitable incomes, we must provide at least the minimal statutory instruments that are required. Thus, we must undertake to provide means for adjustment of supply to market demands at prices that will yield acceptable farm income levels. We must do so in all commodities in which a large majority of the producers favor supply management. We must also assure that free riders are not permitted to destroy these, our programs. We must promote exports of farm products, widen markets, and lessen the price impacts of large output. Moreover, strong agricultural exports have been, and I hope they will remain, an important element of our international economic position. In addition to promotion efforts, we must assure our farmers equality of access to agricultural markets throughout the world. We must also execute the intent of the Congress to make imports compatible with domestic goals of farm income. We cannot and we should not try to stabilize farm incomes in all parts of the world. We must give access to our own markets only on the same terms that we are given access to other markets. Thus, I can understand why farmers in this area, some of whom I've talked to this morning, uh, felt that it was unfair to exempt from the recently imposed additional duty of 10% the imports of beef from Australia at the same time that the rich agricultural export market in Japan may be threatened by this very same additional duty on imports from Japan. We must make explicit the right of farmers to bargain collectively under the same terms available to other elements of the economy. There is growing awareness that we can and must tie the abundance of our farm production to the needs of our poorer people. Much has been done. Much more can be done. There is clear need to evaluate the use of American farm productivity in serving the foreign policy goals of our nation. We must proceed with pro uh, protection of consumers. Yes, we can't forget them. But we need not, and we must not gratuitously damage agriculture in doing so. Farmers themselves can often lower their costs and increase their income by selling product and purchasing supplies jointly and on a scale that will assure 
economic equality as, you, as you've done to such an extent in this great state of Iowa. But we must support farmers who are building organizations that can achieve equality in the markets not only of today, but of tomorrow. Their efforts merit understanding and affirmative collaboration by government. Perhaps hardest of all is really to decide that government must not knowingly or otherwise pursue a continued policy of cheap food and low farm income. We have done so, in my opinion, far too long. We've been lucky that farm officials We've been lucky that farm efficiency alone has prevented greater injury than has occurred to the nation. We shall have to acknowledge, all of us, that farmers must be enabled to sell at prices that will bring them decent incomes. In the short run and in the long run alike, it is a national necessity that we do this, and the time may well be growing short within which we have that opportunity. A responsible and competent administration should use available programs and laws to help farmers increase their earnings, not grudgingly, reluctantly, or when pressed, but affirmatively and with intent to achieve the goals that the people through the Congress have set as national objectives. It can be done, and where the will to do it prevails, it shall be done. All of us by now, I hope, have learned that depressed incomes of commercial farmers is not the only rural trouble with which we are afflicted here in the United States. 